Good morning, Restore Community Church. It is my pleasure to see you this morning. Well, I, maybe it's your pleasure to see me. I don't, I don't really know how this works, but thank you so much for tuning in, whether you're watching this Sunday morning on July 2nd, or maybe this is some other day that you're tuning in. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you clicked. I'm glad you're here to hear the word, as Ian's going to be coming along shortly and speaking about serving. Uh, we're, we're in the middle of our Bless series. We're on the first S of Bless, and I, I guess I'm giving the sneak peek. It's serve. Um, so please stick around. Ian's about to come in just a second to share the word. So why don't I pray and get out of the way? God, we thank you so much for who you are and all that you've done and all that you've blessed us with. It's more than we really know. It's more than we see. It's more than we hear. You do so so much for it. So let's take a second and just praise you and say, thank you, God. Thank you. And hallelujah. And all God's people said amen and amen. Hello, everyone. Great to be with you again as uh, we're enjoying uh, working through this blessed series, which is kind of our lead up to summer series. Um, what's great about uh, summer is as the weather improves, which it has done, um, we have lots of opportunity to be outside. And as we're outside, then we tend to encounter a lot more people. And the whole idea of our uh, BLESS series is to be intentional uh, with those opportunities that come uh, as a part of our everyday life. Be intentional in terms of building relationship with others, but also having an opportunity to share our faith and to share the love of God. And so uh, if you've been watching for the last few weeks, you'll know that we started with the, the B week, the begin with prayer. And for me, what I've been doing uh, for the whole of this year, actually, is at the start of the year, I asked God to give me five people that I regularly pray for. And my goal was through 2023 to regularly pray for those five people as much as I can. I don't quite do it every day, but I have it in mind. And uh, because I'm regularly praying for them, what that has done is it's made me really attentive to um, building relationship with them. And so any opportunity that I have to connect with them, um, I say yes to. And actually it has really focused me in a new way. And I was sharing the other week in Loughton um, some of the stories out of that. And uh, I challenged people to go away and think of five people that they could regularly pray for. And someone messaged me the very next day and said, um, I went home, I made my list of five people. And then this morning, one of them has rung me and they never ring me. And uh, for them, it was just a little bit of, of a sign of when we step out in obedience for God, then God responds. And so I wanna encourage you, identify that small group of people and regularly start praying uh, start for them and be ready for the opportunities that God then gives you on the back of it. So that's the first week, the week B. Second week is about listening to people. Remember, it's not about uh, so much us being ready to preach to people or what we feel like we need to say to people. To begin with, we just wanna listen to people. And uh, these days, one of the most powerful ways that we can express love to people is to take the time actually to listen to them. Um, last week, we were looking at eating. That's got to be the favourite week, hasn't it? Hey, uh, <coughs> Jesus did lots of his ministry uh, eating with people. It's one of the ways that he showed acceptance and uh, fellowship with people, shared life with people. And in our uh, busy culture, I think it, again, is one of the significant things we can do for people. And again, for my five people, I, I'm e emphasising um, taking the opportunities to listen to them, but also to have cups of coffee or opportunities to uh, share a, a meal or food with them because it's one of the ways that we deepen relationship. So we go through this process of firstly, beginning with prayer, secondly, making time and space to listen to people, understand what's going on in their lives. Thirdly, to deepen the relationship uh, by eating together. And then fourthly, that takes us on to this week, which is all about serving people. Now, why is serving important? Well, Serving is important because it's one of the ways that we express love to people. And the thing is, we can say we really love people, um, but love has to have arms and legs on it. Love has to have some practical expression to it. And uh, when we have a heart to serve people, then we emulate the heart of God, but also we get to share love and minister love into somebody else's life. Jesus said in uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he said, for even the son of man, talking about himself, did not come to be served, but to serve 
and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Mark's gospel has got lots and lots of stories of Jesus serving individuals. And actually, when you read through the gospels and read the life of Jesus, Jesus was always all about serving other people. And the way that he served people was a demonstration of his, his, uh, his love for them. You know, the most famous verse in the Bible is John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave. And because God was passionate about being reunited in relationship with us, he had to put that into action. So he gave his son, Jesus, because Jesus was uh, passionate about expressing love to a broken world. With every opportunity that he possibly could, he took that opportunity to serve. And so this week is all about lining ourselves up to that heart of God and saying, God, here I am, I'm ready and I'm willing to serve for you. God, who do you want me to serve? And uh, for today's um, sermon, we're going to look at a story from uh, Mark's Gospel where Jesus serves an individual. And it's uh, in Mark chapter 7, and uh, it's uh, Jesus uh, ministering to a guy. It um, starts in verse 31, so I'll read the story. And then uh, we're going to pick up on some uh, significant points that are maybe a pointers for how we can um, better serve uh, those uh, that God puts uh, in our path. So Mark 7, verse 31. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spat and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven with a deep sigh and said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He's done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. That's a great story, isn't it? I love um, regularly coming back to the Gospels because there's so many wonderful stories. This is one of the great stories because it's one of the stories where Jesus heals somebody by spitting, which is not really the conventional way that we expect uh, someone to minister healing on a Sunday in church. But there's some great principles from this, as I say, that can really help us in uh, thinking about the way that we serve other people. And uh, you need to be impressed today because I've got four Ps for the points that I'm going to bring out today. They're only slightly forced, but four Ps to help you hopefully remember them. So what's the first P about serving? Well, the first one is proximity. Proximity. What you find as you journey through the Gospels is Jesus dealt with the situation that presented itself to him. So although Jesus uh, was on a journey, actually in this story, Jesus is on a journey, um, but uh, Jesus' focus isn't so much the destination that he's going to, but every day he's available and ready to be used for what comes across his path. And so Jesus is on this uh, journey and, uh, and uh, he comes across this guy who, uh, and this guy has some friends who've clearly heard that Jesus is a healer. This guy has a need because he can't hear and he can hardly speak. And so they bring him to Jesus. And so Jesus simply deals with the thing that he encounters, the situation that's right in front of him. And I think that's, I, I find that really helpful when I think about it, because when I first became a Christian, I uh, read a whole load of uh, books, biographies of, uh, of people who uh, were passionate about Jesus and had gone and done amazing things. So I read about people like Jackie Pullinger who'd gone uh, from the UK to serve God in Hong Kong. You can read stories like Mother Teresa and other classic ones. But often in those books, when you read them, uh, they're about people who journeyed from this land to another land to serve Jesus. And quite often, I think, we then get caught up with, God, where do you want me to go for you? And I can remember when I was young, um, spending a number of years thinking, God, where have you called me to? Where do you want me to go? And I kind of got fixated on place. And, and I had, in, in some senses, a, a sense of, when I know the place that God's calling me to, then I'll be able to do the things that God uh, wants me to. Um, but over time, I've realised that I don't think that God is con as concerned with place as I thought. I think he's more concerned with how I live my life 
right here, right now. Because actually, when you think about it, every country of the world, every village of the world, every city of the world, every place in the world has got people who don't yet know Jesus. And so wherever we are, there's opportunity. Wherever we are, there's a mission. Wherever we are, there's an opportunity to express the love of God. And I think God's less concerned about where we are, but more concerned about how we live in the places where we are. And then when I look at the life of Jesus, I see that he was more interested in people than he was in places. And I think for us, the starting point of serving people is actually choosing to be available wherever we are. I've said uh, many times, uh, maybe it'll be an in phrase to go down in history, who knows. Um, but I think the best ability that we can ever have for God is availability. And one of the most powerful things we can do is say, God, here I am today, wherever I am, whoever I meet, let me be alert that you might be able to use me for your kingdom. And then when we go about our usual day, when we go to work, when we go to the shops, when, we, when we're out cutting the lawn, uh, in every context or every situation, let's be available that maybe God wants me to do something here. You know, I talked earlier about I've got my five people that I'm praying for uh, this year. One of those is, is uh, my next door neighbour. And uh, a few, a uh, couple of months ago, our next door neighbour knocked on our door to um, see if we'd seen anything uh, the previous day um, because they'd bro been broken into the previous day, which was really sad. Um, and we had a little conversation about that. Um, but when he went away, um, I chatted to Chris and we thought, do you know what, we need to buy them something for that because it's actually quite traumatic to have your house broken into. They're both from another country as well. So um, that can be quite an unsettling thing. So um, the next day we went out to the supermarket. We found a nice uh, uh, flower in, in a, pot, a plant in a pot, um, wrote them a card. And the next evening I went round and just knocked on their door and said, you know, we were really sorry that you got broken into. And uh, we just wanted to give you this, um, just to say we kind of care and, and to kind of bless you. And the guy was quite taken aback, and he was like, why didn't you come in? And, um, and we'd literally just finished dinner. Chris expected me to be really quick. I suddenly realised I wasn't going to be so quick. And I said, can I just go and, and say to Chris, and I'll come in? And he said, well, why don't you get Chris and bring her in as well? So I went and got Chris, and we went in. And uh, funnily enough, um, his wife works as an accountant, and they don't drink that much, but she gets given lots of drink. And so they said, why don't you have a drink? And then they looked at what they had, and they had several bottles of champagne. So they ended up opening a bottle of champagne, and we were drinking champagne in their living room. But we had a really, really good conversation on the back of just responding to an ordinary need. Now, that is the kind of um, availability that I think God wants us all to have. And so it is making a choice to say each uh, day, I'm going to be less concerned about my to-do list. I'm going to be less concerned about the things that I feel like I have to do. And I'm going to be more alert for people I meet along the way as a part of the journey. And I'm going to be open and receptive that maybe God wants to use that encounter that I might be a blessing to them. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we were on holiday in Cornwall, a little fishing village called Mausel, and uh, staying in a friend's place. And uh, on our last morning, there was quite a ruckus outside and, uh, and somebody had, uh, a holiday maker had, had created a whole incident and uh, we ended up with the police getting called and everyone was out and there was huge upset or whatever. Um, we were just packing up to go home because it was the day that we were going to leave. Um, I went outside and ended up in a whole load of conversations, um, conversations with the policeman, conversation with the community and things. It meant that we took longer packing up and leaving than we were anticipating. But actually, I had an opportunity in a small way to start to pass to that community just because something happened on our doorstep. And I could have chosen not to get involved or I could have said, you know what, there's a need here. So I'm going to step into it and I'm going to, as I step into it, I'm going to uh, use this as an opportunity to care for the people around me. And it wasn't a difficult thing to do, but it was a choice I had to make to say, I'm willing, I'm available, God. Here's the situation that's presented itself to me. Now I'm going to serve into it. I'm going to love into it. I'm going to care into it. So the first P is, is Jesus um, started in his own proximity. We started with the people who were uh, in his own proximity. So who around you today or this week needs you to express some love to them? And can you serve them 
in some sort of way that will express love to them. So start with the people who literally you encounter, who are um, in close proximity to you. Uh, Dave Ferguson says, our mission is wherever our feet take us. Our mission is wherever our feet take us. Again, that gift of availability. Second thing that we get from this passage is we get um, that Jesus served perceptively. Jesus served perceptively. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it says in verse 32 that uh, uh, the people brought um, the man to Jesus. He was in close proximity. In verse 33, it goes on, and it says, after Jesus took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ear. And what we see is when Jesus was confronted with this guy, he didn't instantly launch into healing him. He actually, it feels like he took a moment to look at the guy, consider his situation, and then think, how can I best serve this man? And in that context, he decided he would pull him away from the crowd. Now, why did he pull him away from the crowd? We don't entirely know, but one of the uh, things that would have happened as he pulled him away from the crowd is it would have quietened things down and it would have given Jesus the ability to pay close attention to the guy. And if you think about the guy, given that he couldn't hear, given that he couldn't speak uh, clearly, probably he got lost in crowds or mistreated by crowds. And actually, Jesus was aware that this guy had vulnerability around his life. So he took him to a safe place and then he ministered to him. Now, through that process, Jesus was being very perceptive about what the guy needed, but also very sensitive to what the guy needed. And when we have a passion to serve people, we also need to make sure that the way that we serve them fits the context that they're in and will um, be a blessing to them and not a hindrance to them. And if we misplay or misunderstand their context, we can end up doing something that we think is helping them, but actually does more harm than good. I'll give you a couple of examples of it. Um, there's, a, there's a classic book um, written by um, a lovely uh, Catholic guy called Stephen Covey. And it's called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's one of the classic kind of business books to uh, read. Really, really good book. But he tells a great story, and I mean, really sad story, as you'll know in a minute, a great story about when he gets this wrong. And uh, he talks about being on a, uh, on a uh, subway journey in New York City. And uh, he gets on the subway carriage, and uh, this guy gets on with two small kids. And uh, as they go on the, the subway journey, these kids are going absolutely ballistic. So they're running up and down the carriage, they're causing havoc and, and everything else. And uh, Stephen does probably what most of us would do, is he gets progressively more and more wound up by it. And he keeps looking at the guy, and the guy's doing absolutely nothing to care for his kids. And so Stephen's getting more and more wound up, and at the end he thinks, I just need to say something to this guy. So he says to this guy, look, I'm really sorry, um, but, your kids are a real handful, and it seems to me that you need some help in terms of caring for your kids. So this guy then looks at Stephen, and he looks him in the face, and he says, you're absolutely right. We've just come from the hospital, and their mother's died, and I don't know what to do. And Stephen Covey was like, ah, I've just so judged, and in my mind had an idea of his context but I've so missed where this guy really is at. And there's a, another great book that, uh, that has very influenced how we do a lot of our um, generosity to the local community, both in the UK and overseas as a church. Um, and it's a book called Toxic Charity, written by a guy called Robert Lupton. Um, someone asked me, actually, if we will compile a list of books um, that have been kind of significant books in terms of our life as a church, and I, I think that might be a really good thing to do, and this would be one of them that I would put on that list, Toxic Charity by Robert Lupton. And the whole um, issue that it picks up is that quite often what we think is blessing other people, for them, isn't as great a blessing as we think it would be. And so he tells a story about, uh, he's based in, in Atlanta in the States, 
tells a story about one Christ Christmas when they're working in a uh, needy neighbourhood. And they decided that they would buy a whole load of expensive uh, gifts and uh, knock on doors and give them to parents to be able to give their children for Christmas as a kind of real e extra blessing. And so they go and they're meeting all these mums um, on the doorstep and they're giving them these presents and, uh, and feeling really good about it because they feel like they're doing a really, really good thing. And uh, one of their church happened to go around the backyard and uh, walk down a, a lane that, that went behind the backyard of some houses. And the very same houses where um, mothers were receiving these gifts and being grateful at the front door, he found some guys in their backyard crying because they felt such a failure and such a sense of shame that they weren't able to provide the kind of Christmas gifts that other people would naturally want them to be able to provide. And what they found out is that actually it was doing damage into those families, even though they thought they were being a blessing. And so they went away and thought about it, and they came up the next year with a way that the neighbourhood could work together, and they got hold of a shop, and uh, they got people to donate toys again, but they then um, put them in the shop, and they had a way that people could donate time and energy and uh, resources, volunteer in the shop, care for the neighbourhood, do different things that would then earn them discounts on the toys that they could then buy from the shop. And what they found is that people's sense of value and worth grew because they found a way that it empowered people to be able to take a step forward rather than rob them of their worth and their dignity. And uh, what I'm always struck with with Jesus is Jesus, in his encounters with people, he never robbed anybody in need of their worth and their value and their dignity. And so as we think about how we serve people, and I know in the moment that you first encounter people, you haven't always got time to find all, all the backstory. I, I understand that well. But we just need to think, is this really going to bless them? Is this my idea of what I think will bless them? But from their end, will it really meet the need that they have and that we're seeking to um, express God's love into? So our first P was proximity, start with where you are. Our second one was uh, perceptively or with sensitivity. Our third P is personally. Jesus served people personally. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is Jesus gave of himself into the relationship when he served. So in verse uh, 34, it says, Jesus looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ethartha. That's great. It's one of those great words, isn't it, for a preacher? You get these words and you think, <coughs> how on earth do you pronounce that? And what I've learned through the years is you just have to say it confidently and everybody thinks it's the right way of um, expressing it. So with a deep sigh, Jesus says to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. And it was the key, actually, to this guy being uh, uh, healed. But did you notice it says Jesus looked up to heaven and he made a deep sigh? Now, what do you think that was all about? If we look in the Greek, the word for sigh isn't like <sighs> a, a kind of frustration, like a parent might be when they get plagued by their kid for one more uh, thing that they uh, are asking you to do, or a bit more money or something. It's the word for a deep groan that expresses like a heart cry or a heart longing. And it's like Jesus in those moments felt such compassion for the guy. He couldn't help but express it before he then spoke a word of healing. And you probably know, but a, a number of key incidences in the Bible where Jesus does a miracle, just before it, it talks about Jesus feeling compassion. And the word compassion means with passion or with love or with a deep caring. And actually the root of the word mean, means a deep longing in the very guts of who you are. And so what we find through the life of Jesus is Jesus doesn't just meet people, but his heart is open to feeling that person's pain, entering into the grief. I've always been struck in the story of, uh, uh, of Mary and Martha and Lazarus being raised from the dead. You know, they send a message to Jesus and say that Lazarus has died. Will he come quickly? And uh, Jesus delays, but then he comes there and he gets there four days after Lazarus has died. 
And, uh, and both Mary and Martha go running to Jesus and say, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. Um, such, because they know such is the power of Jesus. Jesus gets to the tomb. He sits down and it says, Jesus wept. And you read that and you think, why are you weeping, Jesus? You know that you're going to raise him from the dead. So why are you weeping? And my interpretation of it is Jesus wept because as he sat with Mary and Martha and experienced their grief, he got hold of a sense of this is what people go through on the earth. This is what it feels like when somebody close to you dies. And even though he knew that uh, the end of the story was going to be changed, he was going to uh, resurrect Lazarus, even though he knew that, he still entered into the depth of the grief. And maybe it was his entering into the depth of the grief that motivated him then to raise Lazarus from the dead. Who knows? But you know, I think one of the biggest challenges for us in serving other people is it costs. You know, we talked earlier about the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for others. And when we serve, we uh, lay our needs to a side and we put somebody else's needs ahead of our own. And that costs. And in our contemporary world, I think one of the greatest challenges is for many of us, we're not sure if we've got the emotional capacity to take on somebody else's burden. So we protect ourselves from it. I think that's a sign of the fact that for many of us we're overloaded and, uh, and uh, we're stressed. And so our emotional resilience is really low. Um, but you know, if we really are going to be people who see the love of God change the world around us, we've got to be willing to be people who invest emotionally in the lives of others. When you think of some of the great stories of people who've expressed the love of God, think about a Mother Teresa, and think about a Jackie Pullinger. What's marked them out is they've been willing to give everything that they have for the sake of serving someone else. Now, I'm not saying to you this morning, you need to be willing to give everything to serve other people, although ultimately, if we're going to live like Jesus, that is where God wants to get us to. What I'm saying is, you need to be willing to give something as a start. You need to be willing to enter in to somebody else's pain and not just ignore it or anaesthetize yourself to it. You know, I think we watch so many distressing situations um, on the news that often it means that we anaesthetize ourselves to the pain of the world. I think so often we uh, uh, are busy and have our own concerns. We just shut the world out. We just get on almost on autopilot. This is about choosing not to do that and actually to engage with somebody else's suffering and pain. You know, sometimes I intentionally read a story or read a book that will engage me in somebody else's story and pain just to make sure that my heart is still alive to it and that I have a desire and a willingness to be able to care. Just feel, for some people uh, watching this morning, actually you're watching this and you're thinking, it's right what you're saying. I've cut myself off from caring. Do you know, God will make sure you are never overwhelmed. The resources of God never run dry. You may feel like you have very little to give, but God is able to multiply the little that you have and use that to feed a much bigger need than you would ever expect. It's a little, little bit like Jesus with the uh, five loaves and the two fishes. That was impossible to feed 5,000. It was totally impossible to go that far. They could have given up at the very beginning and thought that's not enough. But what Jesus did was he offered to God the little he had and then God multiplied it. And I just feel like God's saying to you this morning, if you offer the little bit of your heart that's left, if you offer the little bit of emotional capacity that you've got, then I believe God's saying, I will multiply it for you. And do you know what? Every time that I've put myself out when I felt like I've had nothing, I've been so encouraged by what God did as a result of me sacrificing that bit that actually that's refueled me and re-energized me and done me good. Because the truth is, like Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than receive. And so quite often we think, oh, I've got nothing to give. And so we hold on to the little we have. But actually, if we're generous with it, then multiplies it. Then God multiplies it and it brings us into the blessing of God. 
So I, I dare you this week, um, I dare you this week, use the little bit that you've got and give it away to somebody else. Get involved in somebody else's situation. Be willing to care. And if you feel that you've withdrawn your heart from others, maybe you just need to um, take a moment. Maybe I'll lead you in prayer in a few minutes. And we'll take a moment and we'll repent of where we've let our heart grow uh, cold or hard and we've withdrawn our hearts and we'll pray and ask God to again restore that, uh, that compassion, that uh, willingness to care and involve ourselves in other people's situations. Paul, when he talks about the early church, talks about being willing to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. And such a power in being willing in to enter into somebody else's suffering. And if we enter into someone else's suffering, we also get opportunities to enter into other people's joy as well. And then we find the richness of life that God really intends for us as we live that in community. So four Ps, proximity, start where you are. Number two, perceptively, so with a sense of sensitivity. Number three, personally, give of yourself into a situation. Don't just observe somebody's pain, enter into it. And then number four, powerfully. Powerfully. It's great how this uh, ends, isn't it? Because Jesus looks up to heaven, he utters his deep sigh, he says the unpronounceable word, and then at this, the man's eyes were opened and his tongue was released, and the supernatural power of God transforms an individual's life. And sometimes when we talk about serving, I think we uh, naturally gravitate towards the, I'm going to give somebody a cup of cold water, I'm going to do a practical act for someone, I'm going to um, do some shopping for them, or I'm going to buy them a gift, or I'm going to write them a card. They're all great things to do, really, really good things to do, and I would encourage you to do them all. But you know what? One of the best ways we can serve someone else is pray for them when they need us to. And pray asking for a miracle. When was the last time that you met somebody and they were ill with something? And they talked to you about their illness and stuff. Did you just sympathise? Did you maybe um, uh, talk about your own illness? I find as I get older now, I end up in more situations. I think, cool, we sound like old people. Everyone's telling, talking about what medication they use and all that other stuff. Um, what about we go about our everyday life with an expectation that God is with me and God wants to work through me to bring some healing to other people? And let's take the opportunity to pray for people. Let's take the opportunity to um, express our love by saying, do you know what, would you like me to pray for you? And one of the things that I've learned through the years of ministry, I've been in Christian ministry over 30 years now, so a lot of experience, a lot of encounters, a lot of conversations through the years. What I've learned is mo in most situations, if you offer to pray for someone who doesn't yet know Jesus, most people will say yes. Some people will say, not right here, right now, but yes, please. Some people, quite a lot of people, will let you pray for people right here, right now. I was reading a story of a, of a, uh, a church leader in Norway, and he was saying his experience in the church is that when they pray for the sick to be healed, something like about 10% of people in the church get healed. But he says when he prays for people out in the community or on the streets, over 80% of people get healed. Isn't that amazing? That's because God wants to reveal himself to people who don't yet know him. And uh, he, uh, they regularly see a lot more healing because they do it out in the community. I wonder whether sometimes we haven't got lots of testimonies because we don't pray enough for people who don't yet know Jesus. So when you're thinking about, he, uh, about serving people, Let's be alert, let's be available, let's be alert for the people God brings in our pathway. Let's be sensitive or perceptive to their needs. Let's uh, 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 really empathise, really get involved in their situation. Uh, 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 let's uh, uh, really take it personally. But fourthly, let's have an expectation that we're going to see the power of God at work. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 12, very truly I tell you, this is to the disciples, whoever believes in me, will do the works I have been doing, and they will even do greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. See, Jesus said, because I'm going to the Father and I send the Holy Spirit to fill you, to equip you, to empower you, you're going to see the same kind of things that I see. And when you look at the Jesus, when you look at life of Jesus, so many people 
had a supernatural encounter with the power of God and saw their sicknesses uh, 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 healed or uh, were set free from things. And we need to have the same expectation today that when we pray for people, when we take the opportunity, God will move. So don't do all the practical stuff and not also offer an opportunity to pray for someone because that prayer might be the thing that changes their whole situation and that leads to that impersonal encounter with Jesus. It's great, isn't it, that we get to be part of, uh, uh, the Bible calls it co-laborers, that we get to work alongside uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit to carry his love into the world around. We're going to pray uh, right now, so why don't you close your eyes? I'm going to do two things as I pray. Uh, number one, I'm going to pray over our availability this, uh, this coming week and this season. And uh, I just feel like the Lord um, just wants us to offer ourselves afresh to God and say, God, here I am, send me, like Isaiah uh, spoke when he encountered God in, uh, in Isaiah 6. And the second thing I want to do is pray for our hearts and pray for that renewing and that refreshing and, uh, and that uh, openness in our hearts to really care for others in the world around us. Yeah. Lord, thank you that you put us into community. Thank you you put us into family, Lord. Thank you we're not on our own. Even if we're watching this live stream or uh, this computer screen on our own, thank you we're part of a worldwide community of followers of you. And Lord, thank you that you've uh, invited all of us to be participants in uh, your ministry, in your work, in your call to reach the world for you. And Lord, I pray for each and every one of us, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that this coming week we will be available for you to use. Lord, will you spare me, will you spare us from being so fixed on our destination or our to-do list that we ignore the people who come across our path? Lord, I pray this week we will be alert to those moments where you're wanting us to serve others, maybe by listening to them, maybe by blessing them in some way, maybe by doing an act of kindness, maybe in terms of offering prayer for them. Lord, we want to be an available people who every single day when we get up, we say, here I am, Jesus. Will you use me today to be a blessing to someone else? And Lord, I pray for those of us, and Lord, our hearts have maybe just got a little bit jaded. Maybe we've been through uh, a quite a squeezing season, and so we've ended up putting uh, protective barriers around our hearts. Lord, I want to repent of where I've let my heart get cold. I want to repent of where I've let my heart get hard. I want to repent of where I've closed down to serving others. Lord, will you forgive me? Because I know that that's not how you've called me to live or who you've called me to be. And Lord, will you right now, will you renew my heart? Just where in Ezekiel you uh, promised to Israel you would take their heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh once more. Lord, will you renew our ability, our willingness, our desire to care and to love and to invest our lives in the needs of others. In Jesus' name, amen. It's been great being with you today. We're going to go back to worship in a moment, but can I really encourage you um, this week, uh, why not give it a go? Give it a go at saying each day, Jesus, I'm available for you. I'm going to look for one opportunity every day where I can bless and serve someone else just as my little step of putting your love into action in this world. God bless you. Look forward to hearing your stories next week. Take care. I hope you really enjoyed Ian's message just now about serving, whether you have a little or a lot. Don't, we can't just hold it in. It's better to give than receive. So if we want to reach our neighbors, our community, we got to learn how to serve by, by beginning by praying, by listening, by eating with them. I mean, that's, that's the nice one. But serving is also a nice one because it is blessed and God will bless it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please don't let it go in one ear and out the other. Let it bounce around in your brain. Let it echo in your heart. 
because this is a message that God wants you to hear and wants you to take into your life, each and every one of us. But that's it for us today, guys. And until we see you next time, bye.